Well, 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 if it isn't the bounce back, Pacers bouncing back again one day after one of their worst performances of the season. The Pacers host the Hawks and crush them. One of their best performances in a while. Dominance from the start of the second quarter onward. Didn't need clutch time to win for the first time in a while. How'd they do it? Why Tyrese Halberton and how he's changed his fourth quarter approach a little bit. And the Pacers bench stepping up. We'll talk about it all today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today, big one to get to, Pacers do it again. They do the bounce back thing that they've been doing all season. They keep putting themselves in a situation where they need to bounce back, but they keep doing it. Terrible night Monday in New Orleans. They get smoked against a very banged up Pelicans team. Come out against the Hawks. They just crush them. From late first quarter on, the Pacers look great. We'll break down the game, how the Pacers got it done, what they did so well. It's a pretty good Atlanta team. Over 500 coming into this game. Have one of the better point guards in the league. And yet the Pacers just destroyed them. How the bench stepped up, right? Big thing for the Pacers has been their bench struggles this season. Bench was huge in this game. And Tyrese Halberton's fourth quarter approach been a little different according to the numbers not according to the people we'll talk about that to get you guys out of here today but we'll start with the game of course the thing that happened the Pacers win and this one was so so interesting because for a lot of Pacers wins basically every Pacers win this whole month they've had clutch time they've been within five points of their opponent within the last five minutes sometimes they've held on a lot of times they've lost those games but basically every win they've had this entire month has had that this finally was a game where the Pacers did not need close closeness to get it done right they they were close ish in the fourth it was a six point game at one point but that does not tell the story of how this game went because the Pacers you know choppy back and forth in the beginning right Hawks go up six then it comes back into a one point game Hawks go up five back to one point game Pacers take the lead late in the first quarter for the first time in this game, I think their first lead was 26 25. That's exactly what it was after a Benedict Matherin lamp. They never trailed again. That was with a minute 30 to go in the first quarter. So the Pacers led for the final 37 and a half minutes of this game against the Hawks. They dominated for a super, super long time from that first quarter stretch on. And there really was a lot of key moments in this game, but their second quarter was just awesome it, that's a rare moment of dominance for the Pacers where they go on a run in the second quarter but they were only up one late in the first right they're up three midway or excuse me at the quarter break they were up 15 just over halfway through the end of the second quarter and this is something that's happened a few a couple times in this month but not very often this entire season is they were able to sit Tyrese Halberton and to grow the lead at the same time right the lead gets up to 42 57 with largely bench players in for the Pacers. Tyrese Halberton didn't check in the second quarter until the 424 mark of the quarter. It was already 5342 at that point because the Pacers' second unit was so huge for that stretch from late first till mid second. Carlisle just left him in. Why would he take him out? They've been so good. And now you have a well rested Halberton. That means his minutes are going to be down the whole game. We'll talk more about that in the second segment. And then he just happens to also play well to close the quarter. He himself hitting shots as well as you know getting other guys involved. And they take a 10-point lead into halftime. Choppy third quarter with some back and forth stuff. And then, uh, you know, it was kind of a typical, like, not phoning it in third quarter, but just both teams kind of figuring out what was needed. But in the fourth, it looked like for a second, the bench was going to blow this one. It got to a six-point game. I think it was 103-97 was as close as it got. Yeah, that's exactly right again. <laughs> My memory is serving me well. John Collins scores. Timeout. Rick Carlisle has to sub early this time. He brings in Tyrese Halberton. And the lead was back to 10, not even a minute later. 42 seconds after bringing Halberton in in the fourth. The Pacers were up 10. He hit another three soon after to get him up 12 at the 7-12 mark. It was never close again. The Pacers dominated, dominated from that sub on, right? 103.97 at the 8.51 mark of this game at the 5.14 mark, right? So we're talking about three and a half minutes later. It was 124-103. So the Pacers went on a 21-6 to six run in about three minutes. They crushed the Hawks in the fourth quarter. The, the lineup that was in there for most of it, Neesmith, Brissett, Smith, uh, Heald, and Halliburton was fantastic. Turner was really good down the stretch in this game. 
as well. And then when Neesmith fouled out and Nembard came in, he did a good job. They got great contributions from everybody in this game who played, basically did their job. But as soon as that sub was made, they went off. So really good Rick Carlisle game, right? He had the right lineups in there all the time, right? He he kept the starters in for the perfect amount of time in the first quarter. He kept the bench in for the perfect amount of time. He got through to the end and had the right unit in to close the game out. It was really good stuff from basically every Pacers player who played. And you know, to, 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 it looked like for a second, like it never felt like in the third quarter, the Pacers and Hawks tied the third quarter at 32, right? So a, a totally even quarter. It never felt like the Pacers had control. It felt like the Hawks were in more control for some reason. So when it went to that six-point game early in the fourth, to me it kind of felt like the air was coming out of the building and the Hawks were about to go on a run. And the Halliburton came in and immediately got rid of that. And he just attacked the basket, found some layups. They got enough stops. I mean, it was, it was just perfectly timed basketball from the Pacers right when they needed it. They got it. And the Hawks had very few answers, right? The, 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 the Hawks are a team that, especially without Clint Capella, the Pacers are very well matched up against with the team that they have because they can throw Neesmith on one of their two talented guards, whether that's Murray or Trey Young or even Bogdanovich, depending on who's in. They can throw Nembard on the other one, right? Early in the game, uh, I think Nembard was on uh, Trey Young and Neesmith would guard Murray or Halliburton would, would guard one of them every so often. But, you know, that's a very good matchup. For this and Okongwu, Onyeka Okongwu, their center who who fouled out in this game. Well, he fouled out and then came back in because it got challenged. But either way, like he's not fast enough to really punish Miles Turner, so it's easy for them the Pacers to switch. So John Collins really was the only guy on the Hawks who had like a very favorable matchup. He did awesome, but every other player for Atlanta, the Pacers had a good a good body to throw at them and really make it tough for them to kind of be involved in this game and play well. And that, and that was huge for the Pacers. They had good defensive matchups in there at all times. The Hawks could never go on a long, sustained run. It felt like every time they had a chance to cut into the Pacers' lead, I think their longest run had to be only like five. Yeah, the longest run in the whole game was only eight points for either team, right? It never felt like the Hawks had, could get enough momentum. And if they don't have good enough matchups to do so, they're just not going to win. So really good stuff by the Pacers from a matchup perspective, from a rotation perspective. And, of course, every, basically everybody who played – did something well, right? The guys who missed shots in this game, Aaron e. Smith was 0 for 6, and Chris Duarte was 1 for 6, defended very well. And everybody else shot the ball well or passed the ball well or did their job that's expected of them in this game. Really a team performance, uh, but led by two guys, uh, and you'll hear these names all the time. <laughs> you have heard these names all the time this season. Tyrese Halliburton, of course, 23 points, ho-hum, 7 assists, 3 boards. Uh, three for eight from deep, magnificent in the fourth quarter. Over half of his points coming in the fourth, which is the subject of our third segment today. He was brilliant in that moment of the game and was good, of course, for much of the rest of the game. And Buddy Heald also deserves a ton of attention. Six for seven from deep. Obviously, Steph Curry is hurt, which caveats on what I'm about to say, but that put him into first in the league and made three pointers for the season so far. He's been top four for like five years in a row, but he's never been first, right? Someone else has always seized him in some way or another. This could be the year if he stays healthy that he finally is able to be on top of the league leaderboard when the season ends. He was fantastic in this game. He was one rebound from a double-double, and he was for almost the whole fourth quarter. I thought he might get it several times. He never really did, but he had 28 points in less than 30 minutes. He was really, really good in this game. His shot was falling. He was moving around really well. And when those two guys play well, the Pacers offense is going to be good, but they have to defend well enough and they have to get points when those guys aren't out there. And that's why the bench playing so well mattered so much in this game. It let them play less. It let them be you know, more forceful when they were actually in the game and the bench. Everybody did well. That's going to be, again, the subject of our second segment today because Pacers bench hasn't been that good this season. A lot of the time in this game, they were all clicking on the same page. Best that units looked in a while. And so really impressive win for the Pacers. Again, the bounce back stuff. It fascinates me so much this year that this team is so good at adjusting their mental and being prepared for every game and never getting too high or too low. Just come right in and, okay, we lost last night. Let's forget about it. Let's beat the Hawks. And I did it. Seventh in the East now, passing Atlanta in the standings, over 500 once again. Top six in the East sort of solidifying, but the Pacers could move up if they keep playing like this and um, hovering around that playing spot. Looks like something they're going to do. I mean, they continue to do win games like this against teams in the mix, then they're certainly going to end up in that range if they can continue to do so. Let's talk about that bench unit because it's been a big problem for the Pacers that that unit has not been as good as it was early in the season. And a lot of the guys within that unit aren't playing as well 
as they were last season or earlier in the season or something different for all those guys. But it's been, it was noteworthy in this game that it finally clicked. And I don't know if it's sustainable because the Hawks had some crummy defense at times. But I want to talk about what worked, why everybody did so well, and the importance of sustaining it. Before we do that, though, let me talk to you guys about prize picks. Prize picks, super simple. You're going to take Luka Doncic to score more or less than 26 and a half points. LOL, way over. LeBron to have more or less than seven and a half rebounds. KD to have more or less than six and a half assists. That's the gist of prize picks. It's daily fantasy made easy. You pick two to six players. Are you going to score more or less in their prize picks projection? You can up to 25 times your money on any entry. It's not against other people. It's just you versus the projections available on prize picks. They have projections at any sport you watch. NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, college, PGA, anything. They've got it. You can make your entries in a minute or less. It's safe. They have fast withdrawals and operational in over 30 states and Canada. Download the prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com. Sign up. Play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. You deposit $100, they'll give you $100. You deposit $50, Price Picks gives you $50. You get the idea. Don't forget, enter that promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Price Picks daily fantasy made easy. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Brad Rowan, Locked On Hawks. Here the other side of the tail of this game. Nate McMillan, Aaron Holiday, Justin Holiday back in Indy, but the Hawks stunk it up. Their defense was awful, 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 awful. I mean, they, they, that was one of the worst. I mean, credit the Pacers. They made their defense look awful, but the Hawks' defense was not good. In this game, Brad can tell you why over at Locked On Hawks. Hey, Pacers bench, finally good in this game. I keep saying finally like they've been awful for so long, and it's been this big problem, and I would say it's been a minor problem for the Pacers this year. This might have been their best bench game of the year. Maybe that's a little over dramatic, but you know they, they have not had a lot of consistently solid bench play this season. They really got it in this game. They've had a lot of inconsistent second unit performers, right? Matherin has not been bad at all, but he's definitely not been as good as he was early in the season, right? Brissett is always inconsistent on the offensive end. Duarte shot hasn't fallen this season. Jalen Smith's been inconsistent this year. TJ McConnell has lost his trick of scoring. We'll talk about that a little later. Right, that's still a good unit. Those guys have mix and match well, especially with the starters. But as a whole second unit, it has not worked particularly well. This game, it all came together. <laughs> None of that was a problem, right? And the signs were there right away. It was hilarious. First quarter, guess what the Pacers shooting percentage was from their second unit? How about 100%? Those guys went five for five. They were all huge pluses. O'Shea Brissett was a plus seven. Uh, he led the team in plus minus all night. He was very good, right? They did not miss a single shot. Any bench player, Benedict Matherin, Jalen Smith, Duarte, O'Shea Brissett, they all took a shot in the first quarter and none of them missed, right? They were all really good. And then in the second quarter, despite some mixing and matching, all right, Ben Matherin plus 10, O'Shea Brissett plus 12. And just that quarter, right? Those guys were really good in that quarter as well. In the second frame, they were nine uh, for, I can't do math quickly, 13. They were nine for 13 from the, nine for 14, there we go, from the field. Like they were special on offense in this game. They were moving the ball around well. They were getting into the lane and finding each other and in tight angles. They were hitting outside shots. They looked really connected. And the defense was good, too. And that is what this team needed, is to see that unit connected and together because not only, of course, is it good to make shots, duh, but also then you only need 30 minutes from Tyrese Halliburton and 29 from Buddy Heald to win convincingly against a good team in the East, right? The Pacers need to be able to not play those guys so many minutes throughout the regular season. Right? I think that's very important. Yes, they're in, in Halbert's case, he's young. He's got young legs. But playing him less is preferable if you can. And they were able to do that tonight because the bench was so good. And everybody basically did what they do well in this game, right? They, they were losing. These guys sub in, and they changed the game with that excellent first half. O'Shea Brissett, for example, excellent on defense. As When he's at his best, he usually is. Um, and the drives were really huge for him in this game, right? He was, he had a couple buckets in the first half. I think three of his four first half makes were, you know, put it on the floor, drive past, but he finished at the rim, finishing, not his strong. So he was doing it in this game. He hit two threes. He finished with 16 points and five rebounds, right? Fantastic game from him on the offensive end. He was doing everything. TJ McConnell finally knocked down that mid range shot. That's been plaguing him all season. TJ McConnell hits three shots in this game. He also had five rebounds and six assists, right? That shot has escaped him. That made him really, really good. At his, at his best year with the Pacers, right, I, to me, uh, that's his second year, 
the Bjork Grenier uh, in 2020, 21, he was 55% from three to 10 feet, 65% right at the rim and 55% from 10 to 16 feet, right? He'd get in the lane. He'd go for that little fade away over the defender and drill it, or he'd get right into the teeth of the D and score. Uh, and, and that made him a threat on drives, not only because he's a good passer, but because he could shoot that shot last year. Those numbers dropped, but he at least was still hitting the mid-ranger. His rim wasn't as good. This year, he's lost both, right? 56.5% from zero to three feet. That's the second worst of his career behind only last year. 44.8% from three to 10 feet. That is the worst of his career, except for his second year in the league when he was 24 with Philly. 34.8% from 10 to 16 feet. Easily the worst of his career, right? McConnell's mid-range, that was his big weapon to make it so teams would not just defend the passes has not been there. Tonight it was, and that is very important uh, when talking about his game. Duarte was the only guy who wasn't shooting well off the bench, but he did defend well in this game still. Uh, not a lot of room or space or success for uh, the, you know Justin Holiday, for example, one for five. Aaron Holiday over two. A.J. Griffin, four for ten. You know, a lot of the guys that he ended up on, he slowed down. Uh, Jalen Smith finished plays as he does, again, when he's his best and they're able to find him in the right spots. I'm kind of just reading the box score describing how these guys played, but Jalen Smith in 20 minutes, seven boards, nine points. They were all great. They all did their job extremely well, and Benedict Mather had tied it all together by cooking, cooking in this game. Six free throw attempts, missed all his threes, doesn't matter. Still had 18 points on 10 shots. Excellent, excellent scoring game from him, including some to really spark some runs early in the second quarter. Pacers very rarely have this, right? They very rarely have a game where their bench looks super connected. They're all together. They're all playing to the peak of their abilities and showing how that unit can be a unit, right? Not just, okay, here are our bench players, and we'll mix Matherin in with the starter sometimes, and Smith with the starter sometimes, and Brissett with the starter sometimes. And those guys are great with those lineups, but when they're all together, eh, it doesn't work so well. When it does work like this, it's better for a lot of reasons. One, right, what's been happening is their starters do well enough and then the bench loses it, and then it's a close game at the end, and they're reliant on their starters to either hold a lead or come back a tiny bit. In this game, they're not holding on to a tiny lead. They're not trying to come back, right? They were they were up six. I guess that's not a huge lead when Halliburton came in. He was the only starter who subbed at that moment early in the fourth. Like, they were up big when crunch time came, and part of that was because they didn't have to deal with such bad bench play in the fourth or in the first half, right? That was huge. They don't have to do that kind of stuff when the bench is better. They finally didn't have a clutch time win for the first time in forever, and the bench play was a huge factor in that. All those guys were great. I was asking O'Shea about it, Rick Carlisle. I think it'll be a big part of my story on this game that comes out. And you know, so the question is, can this sustain? You know, it, Obviously, you have to question the sustainability of this level of success, but maybe they found something that works here. Like if McConnell can just get that mid-range shot back the way he would be defended, not even mid-range, it's in close. It's less than 10 feet every time. The way he's defended would change so much that it would open up everything. And really, the other factor of it is just making shots for guys like Matherin and Duarte who take mostly good looks, and they just have to put them in the basket. For set, expecting him to be a consistent drive and finish threat, I don't think is is doable. He was at, uh, the, the Hawks you know, did not have had pretty flimsy point of attack defense. He took advantage, but it would be huge for the Pacers if they could even get 80% of this bench performance every game. Cause those guys were all very, very good in a way that right. Less than 30 minutes for healed, less than 27 minutes for Nimbard, barely, barely, barely over 30 minutes for Tyrese Halberton, right? 25 minutes for miles Turner. They could, they didn't have to play their starters that much at a 20 point win because their bench was so good. Like that is something the Pacers need to find a way to hang their hat on. And a funny thing to look at is, you know, PPP stats, my favorite way to get stats because it takes it from play-by-play data, tracks a team's net rating with X number of starters on the floor, right? And the Pacers play the 15th most minutes with four starters on the floor, so about average, the 14th most with three starters, right? So they play their starters a lot. Uh, with two starters, 28th in frequency. Very rarely they only have two starters out there, right? They're sixth in frequency with one starter out there. And there's, you know, they don't have a lot of situations where they have two or one starters. They like to mix it up because their full bench unit has been so bad. So the fact that they got a lot from it this game was much better, right? Uh, they do really well with four starters, three starters, and two starters, not as much with their full starting five, right? The mixing and matching has been good, but getting a lot from that low starters unit 
really helps the Pacers out. And that's something they'll hope that they can continue going forward. And all that was just the precursor for the Tyrese Halliburton put the Hawks away show in the fourth quarter. How did Tyrese do it? And how has he changed his fourth quarter approach recently in a way that has really helped the Pacers as they've won three of four. Let's talk about that to close today's show. Before we do that, though, let me talk to you guys about betonline.net, your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football, college football, bowl season, basketball, college. They've got it all at betonline.net. If you love sports podcasts, guess what? They've got those at Betonline. As well, it's the fastest and easiest way to get all your betting info. It's as simple as that, right? The last NFL game of 2022, Titans, Cowboys, Cowboys favored by 10, for example, right over on there. They've got the BCS. Uh, that's not even what it's called anymore, is it? Uh, the college football lines up for the playoff games, ready to go. All the bowl games coming up are on there as well. Duke Central Florida tomorrow. Duke favored by three and a half. All that and more at betonline.net. Head over to the website or use your mobile device to learn more because Bet Online is where the game starts. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Let's go unconventional here. Locked On Mavs. Why? The Mavs didn't play the Pacers. That's not a general NBA show that I usually like to have you guys listen to. Locked On Mavs because Luka Doncic just had 60 points. 20 rebounds, 21 rebounds, and 10 assists in one game. Holy smokes, insane. You divide those by 10, 6, 2, and 1. It's a good role player game. He times 10, a decent game for role players. Insane performance. Nick and Isaac on Locked on Mavs. We'll break that all down for you. And I talked about it on Locked on NBA if you want to make that your second listen as well. Uh, lots of fun shows here on the network to get your Luka Doncic fix. But we're talking about Tyrese Halliburton right here because he nailed it, put the nail in the coffin tonight. He, he put the Hawks away. He ended this one, right? He was aggressive in the fourth quarter, and it put the game away, as he has been when the Pacers needed him to be in recent times, right? One oh, th- I, I talked about this moment already. 103-97 when Halberton comes in. Six-point game. The closest it was from basically the middle of the third to the end of the game was that moment. Uh-oh. Here come the Hawks, right? That's scary if you're the Pacers. You've had some fourth quarter woes recently. There's almost nine minutes to go. They bring in Halberton 20 seconds later, driving away. Easy. They get a stop, right? Six seconds after that stop, running layup, right? Great job by the Pacers. They really needed that stretch, a couple free throws on both ends. It's 108 99. They're already way ahead because of Halliburton. And then boom, he hits a three with it with 7 12 to go. Seven points in less than two minutes on three shots. Huge, huge, huge stretch. It's impossible to overstate that because it felt like the Hawks. That was the only time in the whole second half it felt like the Hawks had momentum, and Tyrese Halberton took it away. All right, he was massive in the fourth quarter of this game, and that it put the nail in the coffin. And he's been so clutch for the Pacers time and time again against the Celtics last week, against Miami. Obviously, that's his you know his moment now in the league. And now this, this game was less so clutch because there was a lot of time left. But being really good in the fourth quarter like says a lot about him. And it's so fascinating looking at this game. He took 16 shots, right? And the... Look, Tyrese Halbert doesn't shoot that much. Like He's only taken more than 16 shots in a game six times this season. He's taken exactly 16, kind of a lot, but he hasn't taken more than 16. Like, 16 is a lot for him, and he took almost half of them. He took seven in the fourth quarter, right? In that moment, he came in, and he said, i got to be aggressive. I've got to find my shot. I've got to score for us to win, and he did it, and he hits the shots. Like, his percentages are, are fantastic this season, right? Fit. 48% from the field, over 40% from deep. He's earned the right to take those shots, and he nailed them. And that was huge for the Patriots. Almost half his shots coming in the fourth quarter, and I was asking everybody about it. I kind of feel bad sometimes when I do this. Like, people watch the media availabilities on YouTube sometimes, and it's just – I asked everybody who, who the Patriots will upload the video for the same question, among many questions. But it was, you know, hey, have you seen – how have you seen Tyrese Halberton's fourth quarter approach change, Right. Because this is now three wins in a row for the Pacers where he's come in in the fourth, he's looked for his shot, and and it's worked, and he's scored, and it's gotten the Pacers to win. And everybody's saying, no, not really. And that was kind of interesting to me because the numbers suggest that he is playing a little different. But I understand that that does not necessarily mean what they're saying isn't true. Um, and what they all say is kind of similar, that Tyrese, Rick Carlisle said this all season. Hal Burton said this all season. He is very good at identifying what the Pacers need in a given moment and giving it to the team. If that's aggressive scoring, he'll do it. Deferring, great. Passing, great. Like, he'll do it. 
And that is a hugely important skill for this basketball team. It's just so happened that they've needed him to score in these clutch games recently. And when it's what the team needs is him to score, he doesn't, right? And and had it been more sharing, maybe he would have done that. But he needed to be aggressive in this game. 12 fourth quarter points, right? Hawks were down six. They had momentum. And then Tyrese Halliburton scores over half of his points in the game in one quarter, plus 13 in the fourth, a game high by obviously a mile, right? That put it away. He was fantastic. And I think this is just kind of who he is now, right? He's become the clutch guy for the Pacers. He has become that guy uh, who's able to shoot when they need it in those wins, right? Obviously against the Celtics, he had all-star level play, finishes with 33-43 against the Heat, the game-winning shot, bunch of fourth quarter points that night as well. That's just who he is. And so, look, looking, digging into the numbers, actually, yeah, let's just dig into the numbers now, right? Because this is what kind of made me want to ask about this. You know, per, I did this per 36 minutes, so there's no skew. In the Pacers' first 10 games in the in fourth quarters, right, down the stretch, Tyrese Halliburton took 17 shots per 36 minutes in fourth quarters, and then it went up a little bit in games 11 to 20, and then it went way down in games 21 through 30. So the highest it was in any of those stretches was 22. Currently, in the Pacers' last five games, it's at 23.7 shots per 36 minutes in fourth quarters. He's taking more shots down the stretch, right? Six more than it was in the first 10 games, double what it was in games 21 through 30 for the Pacers. Like he is clearly looking for his shot more in fourth quarters. I think that's very noteworthy for numerically. And I don't think that it's like an active, I'm coming in, I'm shooting. I think it's he's realized more in the clutch when the game slows down a tiny bit, right? That score him shooting is what the team needs when the game slows down a little bit. That's what I, my take on it is, is he's reading the game. He says it's slowed down. This isn't our style, but I can still score. And that has been working very well for the Pacers, right? He's not changing his approach. He's coming in, he's identifying what the team needs and he's doing it. He's scoring. And it's so impressive to see him change his, you know, it's not that he, it's not a big change, I guess, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to see that it lands on shooting more so than passing in those situations recently and that it's led to a lot of success for the Pacers, right? Even looking at his assists per 36 minutes in fourth quarters, 10.8, the first 10 games, 10.7, the next 10, 9.4, the next 10, 5.0 in the ongoing 10 game stretch, right? Like that, that kind of t says it perfectly. He's, it's not, again, it's not a problem. It's not a bad thing that the pendulum is swinging this way. In fact, it's good. He had a lot of games where after the game, he said, I felt like I was passive down the stretch. I got to be more aggressive. He's doing it now. He's doing that. It's been huge for them in the Heat win and the Celtics win and in this game. They've won three of four behind his scoring. And Buddy Heald said it, right? He said, you know, he's played with Tyrese his whole career. He said he's maturing so fast. He's growing so fast. And these fourth quarters are the perfect example of that. He's becoming the guy for the Pacers down the stretch. It's no doubt who should have the ball in his hands or should be looking to score these moments. It's Tyrese Halliburton. And this one wasn't even, you know, the Celtics game and the Heat game. He hit some big shots or scored some big points with in the last two minutes, three minutes, whatever it was. Right after that Knicks game where he beat himself up after missing that jumper over Julius Randle, he's been great. In this game, it was much earlier in the clock, but still just as important to put a team away, to get momentum, to get your team and crowd into it to get the human element on your side to get a win. And he was fantastic down the stretch. He made it happen for the Pacers. And now they're 18 and 17. Back over 500. Impressive stuff from this Pacers team. Tomorrow, talk a little bit of Pacers Cavs, but I think I'm going to try to find a guest and we're going to talk the best Pacers moments of the year 2022. Not going to have a lot of chances to do that uh, this week, just given the Pacers game schedule and only having two more shows. And then Friday, we'll talk what happened in Pacers Cavs, preview the Clippers game a tiny bit, wrap up the year here at Lockdown Pacers. That should be really fun. Sorry for the lack of guests recently. It's a lot harder on the holidays. I feel worse bothering people. It's just not my jive to just dive in on people's lives when they're hanging out with their families. But I will hope to have one tomorrow to talk best moments of the calendar year for the Indiana Pacers as we transition into 2023. So Cavs, Clippers, all the coverage coming up this week, as well as fun moments about this basketball team who's over 500 back to seventh in the east and we'll look to keep up some momentum against some strong opponents coming up thank you guys a ton for listening today it's much appreciated back tomorrow like i said talking calves preview and more till then everybody have a great rest of your day